This episode of Macro Mondays aired live at 12.30pm BST on Monday the 28th of October. Tune in Mondays at 12.30pm UK time to watch Macro Mondays live. Hello and welcome to another Macro Monday. My name is James Brody. I'm Head of Learning Development here at Onyx Capital Group. And I'm James Todd, Direct Trader here at Onyx, giving you insight from our trading floor. Today we'll look at key market risks, trends and charts, but we'll also look at the key data coming out this week. We have the most concentrated week of data we had all year, and of course the run-up to next week's November 5th election. Yeah, we'll be looking at how this Trump trade has been gaining some traction, and we'll also be looking at some of the immediate reaction to the uh, military interventions in the Middle East and the impact of that on the oil market. So before we look at some key market movers, let's set the scene a little bit here. The US 30-year mortgage rate has just jumped to 7.25%, the highest level since July, even after a 50 basis point cut by the Fed. US housing has now reached its most unaffordable level since the 1980s. Bonds now offer higher yields than stocks the first time in 22 years. The dollar's the most overbought since 2022. Asset managers have their largest equity long position in over 10 years, and the put call ratio is now at the lowest level since March 2022, as now the NASDAQ composite has joined the S&P in making new all-time highs. The US has also just posted its third largest deficit ever as we go into the US election to pick the new next president. And gold is also making new all-time highs. And I said all this happening as we go into the most concentrated week of data we've had all year, global data, not just US, and of course, November 5th election. Yeah, so just to build upon that, we're going into a busy week of data, anticipated data, but one of the perhaps more surprise bits of information data headlines over the weekend was this uh, Israeli attack in Iran on Friday night. Um, Now, looking at the reaction on the oil market uh, over, well, last, last night's open from Friday's close, because the market you cannot trade on Saturday and most of Sunday, we actually see that uh, the market has responded in quite an interesting way to this intervention. So the the full headline was uh, that the Israelis had destroyed air defense systems in Syria and Iraq. They had destroyed all S-300 and S-400 radars, fully uh, blinding Iranian air defenses uh, in Iran. And they also destroyed key ballistic missile facilities in Iran. So initially, just reading the headline, as is, you might have thought that uh, Israeli attacks in what is a significant oil producing country might be might have a bullish impact upon oil. But this is where it's well worth actually digging into what uh, what goes behind the story here. So a lot of the rhetoric that had been used prior had indicated that Israel might consider attacking Iran's nuclear facilities and maybe even Iran's oil facilities. This intervention on Friday night seems to uh, seems to indicate that they are not going to be doing that. They've crucially avoided all oil and nuclear facilities with this attack. So what we saw was uh, oil opened 4% lower um, last night, this morning, depending on which time zone you are. So it, uh, I think, prompt Brent futures closed Friday around $76 per barrel. They opened this morning at $73 per barrel. They've continued to come off over the course of this morning. Um, and I think what this reveals is that this this intervention perhaps isn't one of actual escalation. The, the terms used by the Iranian premier seem to say that, uh, seem to indicate that they're not going to be expecting much retaliation. Um, he, he said that they shouldn't overestimate, but they also shouldn't underestimate the significance of Israel's attack. This perhaps marks a sign that it's going to be sort of play on from here and we're not going to be moving into a period of further escalation. So I think this nicely explains why we've seen that sell-off in oil over the past 12, 24 hours. 
I think it's also worth mentioning it's well choreographed. Iran was warned this was going to happen. It happened outside market hours. And also now Iran's defences are laid bare. So they know that Israel could attack at any point if they do escalate. So um, it's underwhelming response in many ways, but Iran is left with no option really. Yeah. They're very defenseless if they wanted to escalate. And if we look at, moving on from that, if we look at some key data here, you can see that the oil price and the 10 year yield, the correlation between the two has clearly broken. So what was driving really the 10 year yield was inflation concerns, but now uh, derived from oil, but now what's clearly driving the 10 year yield is the Trump trade. So Donald Trump, the betting markets now have him 62% likelihood of winning the election. And with that, that's driving inflation concerns. Firstly, of course, we've mentioned before, he plans to impose 10% tariffs on imported goods and 60% tariffs on Chinese goods. Also looking to deport millions of illegal immigrants. That will have an impact on overall GDP. Interesting question here though, if you, if you deport illegal immigrants, then typically that would actually improve GDP per capita. Um, and it depends what you want. If you want overall GDP higher for the economy, or you want less crime, which is being highlighted in Europe, and a higher GDP per capita. Um, Trump also wants uh, a voice on the Federal Reserve. But the key thing here, it's seen as being inflationary. And the Peterson Institute for International Economics has predicted that Trump's policies would raise inflation in 2026 from current estimates of 1.9% up to possibly 9.8%. So um, Trump is seen as his policy is going to have a huge impact on inflation. And that's what's driving the 10 year yield here. Yeah, I mean, I think with, uh, with a lot of these policies, it seems as though the, the aim is not necessarily for maximum growth. Imp you know, putting tariffs on imports and decreasing the size of your labor force overall. These are two, uh, two classic things, you know, they're, they're not going to be improving overall GDP uh, in the US. However, I think Trump's Trump's plan for America is not necessarily going to be a growth first in that bottom line GDP uh, metric and we'll, we'll perhaps uh, see some scaling back in overall GDP. But, you know, I, I suppose his aim would be GDP per capita to improve and real purchasing power parity in the long run to improve for the US citizens. And he's saying with this, he's reducing crime and protecting US jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Also creates inefficiencies, as we've seen before with US steel. But I'm sure, you know, as we're going to come on to talk about gold, but with uh, this this inflation that looks almost guaranteed if, uh, if Trump were to come in, we might well see more support for gold there. Yep, gold's a trade we like. Also more curve steepening, twos, tens curve. We'll discuss that a little bit later. The other impact, of course, is imports up 60% imports on Chinese goods, the impact that will have on the Chinese economy, that will be disastrous. And clearly, the Chinese are going to wait to see the outcome of the election before they do more stimulus. Yeah, I mean, I think on the out outcome of uh, the election, it sounds as though Kamala Harris's campaign has been handed a boost because there's this uh, famous correlation between the Washington football team, I, th I think recently been rebranded as the Washington Commanders, with um, their success being matched by an incumbent president being re-elected. So they had a, a quite last gasp and dramatic victory last night. So uh, perhaps Harris is going to win after all. Yeah, we give up on economics. That's a yeah, back to sport. And on to US housing. We had some mixed data out last week, but the key data really, existing home sales hit a 14-year low in September, on track for the worst year since 1995. This is from the National Association of, National Association of Realtors. And home sales are now down 3.5% year on year. This was with lower rates, home sales fell. Now, of course, in the last month, we've had mortgage rates going aggressively higher. So that's just going to send um, existing home sales lower. New home sales did have a bounce, but new home sales are less than one seventh of existing home sales. So it's really existing home sales are key. And you can see this is pretty disastrous data. And affordability is at the worst it's been for 22 years. 
And we've had some data from Fannie Mae, some calculations. That's the Federal National Mortgage Association. Fannie Mae said it would take one of three things or a combination of, of them to return house prices to return to 2016 to 2019 levels. Firstly, the median price of a single family home would need to fall 38%. That is a possibility. We're seeing um, falls moving in that direction, certainly in China and Canada. Or the median household income would need to rise by more than 60%. That clearly is not going to happen. And the other one, the mortgage rate would need to drop to 2.35%, currently 7.25%. So you can see just how unaffordable housing is at the moment. Yeah, it's a, it's a very sticky situation. And as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, off the back of the hurricane season, uh, particularly exacerbating the situation in Florida, insurance premiums are increasing on housing with extreme weather events, wildfires in California pushing insurance premiums on housing up. So a lot of the uh, non-mortgage side of housing is also becoming uh, too expensive for the average consumer. So all of this is pointing towards a slump in demand and you know all, all of these things a 60 percent increase in the median house household income that's dramatic that is is not going to happen overnight yep. um so yeah I, th I think going into an election it's it's perhaps nicely timed for uh, the democrats here because you know it does seem as though there is a serious issue with housing on the horizon that is not likely to come into effect in time for the 5th of november election also in Texas and Florida, there's record amounts of properties for sale that were bought for Airbnb for renting out. Mm. But what I find interesting with this market as well, the housing, it's a trade we can see, it takes time to play out. It's like a slow motion car crash. And real, what really kicks it off is when people are forced to sell. At the moment, of course, people at the offers and the bids are not matching. The bids are much lower below the market, but house prices fall typically when people start to lose jobs and they're forced to sell. But this is a, it's, it takes time to play out. Whereas what we've seen over the weekend, oil markets, headlines, just a headline can move the market. So different reactions um, and different ways markets trend and trade. Yeah, absolutely. Back to the US data, we had some flash PMIs came out, better than expected. The manufacturing PMI improved to 47.8, still in contraction. But the service PMIs, again, service sectors three times bigger than manufacturing, service PMIs rose to 55.3. So again, the US economy is, is still ticking along. We have US third quarter GDP out this week amongst other data sets. But as you're going to see other countries like New Zealand, Canada, France and Germany, the economic data is looking pretty disastrous. We had Janet Yellen as well out this week, the US Treasury Secretary with some comments. First comment I thought was quite amusing. She said, we must keep real net interest of GDP ratio under 2%. She said, keep, well, it's currently at 3.7%. So it'd be good to get there first. Um, she also said high and broad tariffs would likely strengthen the dollar. Um, also, fiscal deficit reduction is required over the coming years. That's one I think we can all agree with, all apart from the incumbent presidents who just want to spend. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, the, the fiscal deficit is far too high. It's, it's reaching astronomical levels. But uh, yeah, you know, what, what she has also said with high and broad tariffs would likely strengthen the dollar. I think that's very much the consensus amongst a lot of people. Um, and yeah, the, the view of the market seems to be that if, uh, if Trump is elected, you know, read, reading between the lines there, she's basically saying if Trump is elected, uh, we're going to see an appreciation of the dollar. And I think that's, um, that's very fair and quite reflective of the situation. Interesting point as well with the fiscal deficit. This is another reason why yields are going higher. We spoke about before Stanley Druckenmiller has highlighted that's why he's selling bonds. But if you look at the US yields, the 10 year yield, and you compare it to break evens, it's not just inflation expectations that are sending bond yields higher. It's clearly this fiscal deficit and concerns there about budgets um, and inability to make budgets going forward that are causing investors to sell US bonds. On to equities. The S&P is now being joined by the e NASDAQ in making new all time highs. Price to sales ratio is the highest level it's been since 2000. 
Last week, we had Tesla closing up 21.9% on one day. That's its biggest gain in history. An interesting chart, looking at the data, the NASDAQ Composite Index. You can see on Friday, it made a new all-time high, but it failed to close above. And actually, we had aggressive selling into the close. So that's actually, as one technical analysis will know, as one standalone candle, that's very bearish. So it'd be interesting to see how the market plays out this week. It's unable to hold new all-time highs and the market closed with aggressive selling. Yeah, I mean, I think something that you've been saying over the past few weeks uh, is that if you make all-time highs and you're looking for an up, upside uh, breakout, it, the, the, you, you do need to close above that all-time high. Um, so it does seem as though there are a number of people that are still taking bets at this all-time high that it's going to be coming off. And then, you know, you'll see the market positioning um, perhaps tested a bit more at those levels. But uh, yeah, I mean, just quickly on the on the Tesla price as well, I, I suppose this is one of the things um, Tesla ran by Elon Musk, who seems to be associating himself very tightly with the Trump campaign. So you might be seeing some uh, fluctuations in Tesla stock prices with uh, odds of a Trump presidency increasing um, at the same time. So it's definitely one to watch, but uh, perhaps not representative of the wider US economy. And to highlight the breaking new all-time highs, and that's the levels to buy, NVIDIA broke 140. We highlighted that last week. It did break new all-time highs. That's typically where you get new buying, but the buying hasn't really followed through. So again, clearly the two are trait highly correlated. Interesting to see how NVIDIA plays out this week. Again, there will be stops below 140 for those uh, accounts, those investors that did buy. An interesting statistic, the NVIDIA gains account for 75% of S&P's gains since October the 7th. Also, NVIDIA is bigger than the entire market cap of five of G7 countries. NVIDIA is four times bigger than the market cap of the Italian market, and it's now half the Nikkei's market cap. So these are just astounding numbers. Is a company worth that much? I, for, for me, I would have thought that NVIDIA uh, is probably not worth four times the Italian economy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, it, it, the fact it's been supported at these new all-time highs, you know, is, is a bit disheartening for anyone that wants to get short because the momentum is just all up and the the AI movement, whilst not going from strength to strength, is seemingly holding ground. So, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought that these levels are sustainable in the long run, but it'd be a fool's game to get short right now. And it is hard to trade off valuations like this, but again, that's where technical analysis comes in. If you are long, then trade it while it's trending higher and when it turns, then take your profits. Yeah. And that's typically where retail have trouble holding on to their, their profits. On to the Euro area. ECB's Christine Lagarde came out very dovishly this week saying the direction of travel is clear. The pace of rate cuts is to be determined. So clearly she's saying we are doing rate cuts, but we've yet to decide whether it's 50 or 25 basis points. Also, ECB's Centineo has said data will tell us if we have to do 25 or 50. The OIS market is currently pricing in 37 basis points of cuts at the next meeting. So the market split 50-50. And on that, the Bundesbank has warned of stagnation as well. So as you can see from the data here, German composite employment from the PMIs, composite PMIs and euro area, you can see employment's weak, but employment is disastrously weak in Germany. Yeah, I mean, building upon what we saw last week with Moody's downgrading the French economy, German manufacturing's continuing to be poor. You know, they're fi finding a positive headline about uh, the central European economies is like finding uh, the needle in the haystack, isn't it? But um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's worrying, but uh, this, this is very much the trend at the moment. And what's amazing is Southern Europe is still strong. So we, we are, what, 10 or 12 years since we had the Greek crisis. Yeah. You probably may not remember. No, I do, I do. Um, but I remember it very well. And what we have now is French long-term yields are now higher than Greece. Um, Southern Europe is economies are strong and it's Germany and France that are weak. So pretty incredible turnaround. Yeah, absolute reversal of roles, isn't it? 
Yeah, and uh, so just building upon that, we saw uh, the ECB bank lending survey. Uh, it actually showed a modest pickup in loan demand for families. Um, so that that's looking across the entirety of the ECB area. So I, th I think what we're seeing is perhaps some of these, um, what had previously been less developed economies, such as the often referred to pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain economies, um, they, they're they seeing some lending demand tick up with uh, improved performance. Um, and, you know, consumption in the coming future of the Bank of Latvia uh, seemed to be slightly slightly bullish, um, but so it's, it's definitely a dividing up of, of these European economies. Also, if uh, important, we pick up on uh, what the data that's beating expectations were uh, flash PMIs coming out of Europe. Well, Germany actually PMIs beat expectations. They're still deep in contraction though. So uh, manufacturing PMIs, jumped from 40.6 to 42.6. Again, improvement, but still deep in contraction. Services jumped from 50.6 to 51.4, so some expansion there. But France was particularly weak. The French in the sea manufacturing business climate had its largest and broadest decline in sentiment since the financial crisis, outside of COVID, I should say there. And French October flash PMIs fell from 49.9 to 48.3. So some signs of improvement from Germany on particularly weak data, um, but France is now looking the real sick economy in Europe. And really they were held up during the summer by spending around the Olympics. Since yeah. the Olympics finished, uh, the data has been disastrous. And yeah, so uh, looking at the UK briefly here, we're, a couple of days out on Wednesday, we're expecting the new um, the new budget from this uh, this new Labour government, and I think people are looking at this perhaps unfavourably uh, from a consumer confidence perspective and from a business confidence perspective. So uh, UK consumer confidence fell for the second consecutive month to minus 21. Uh, it had been negative 20 before. Uh, so this is the lowest level of consumer confidence since March 2024. Um, and we're seeing all of the, well, three of the five subcomponents of uh, consumer confidence uh, indicators, they, they were all lower. The personal financial situation over the next year is up one point and general economic situation is down one point relative to September. So uh, I think a lot of people are looking at this uh, this new budget, you know, even though it's being purported to be for, um, for the working p people, uh, this, this definition of what a working person is is quite loose. Um, and, you know, I think uh, consumer confidence in the UK is understandably falling at the moment. People are definitely expecting the worst from Rachel Reeves, the Chancellor. Definitely. Yeah. Bit of bad news as well for Japanese government, the LDP. They've lost their majority. And from uh, elections over the weekend. Also, the IMF assumes the BOJ will keep raising rates. They assume that they will raise rates gradually over the medium term to 1.5%. With GDP falling, I find that pretty hard to believe as you have some data on uh, shortly on inflation. But 40-year bond yields have increased to 2.53%, the highest level since the financial crisis. And the chart we have up on the screens, if you're able to see that, again, it's a favourite chart of mine. The orange line is dollar-yen and the white line is the two-year interest rate differentials. You can see how highly correlated they are. And even though yen rates are moving higher, the US yields are moving higher more aggressively. We've talked particularly about long end, um, and that's what's pushing uh, dollar yen. It's gone through 153 and more yen weakness over the weekend. Yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised uh, if the IMF are correct in their predictions there. I think that would be rather, rather dramatic. Um, but so, just some more data that came out as well. So we saw uh, core inflation in Tokyo the core inflation rate slowed to 1.8% year on year. Um, this was uh, from 2% in September. So this is the second straight deceleration and it fell below the bank's 2% target for the first time in five months. 
Um, and then just on services, so Japan's services producer price index rose by 2.6% year on year in September. Uh, so this is slightly slowed down in comparison to August, uh, which had, I think it was, yeah, 2.8%. Um, so it shows that corporate pass-through of cost increases remained solid. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just building upon the picture that we're seeing for Japan here, this data. On to Bank of Canada, we had a 50 basis point cut. The OAS there is also pricing another 37 basis points of cuts at the next meeting. GDP is running weak, 1% annualized pace. Composite PMIs at 47.0, showing quite heavy contraction. The unemployment rate is rising sharply, currently at 6.5%. And CPI is also under target at 1.6%. Charts showing uh, dollar CAD going up aggressively here. The reason I highlight Canada here is again another example of just a weak economy. The US economy really is the anomaly. I guess the other economy you could say that's st strong out there is Australia. We'll touch on that in a second. But um, a good example of pretty extreme weakness out of Canada. It will be interesting to see as well if uh, were Trump to be elected and there were to be some tariffs put on uh, Chinese imports into the US. Uh, whether it would be interesting to see what Canada's reaction to this would be because diplomatic relationships between Canada and China have um, started to sour. So uh, it, it would definitely be surprising to my mind if you were to see you know, Canada opening up as an, uh, an opportunity for Chinese exports given the souring of these diplomatic relationships. But uh, I suppose it's all hypothetical at the moment with the election just around the corner. And talking of China, we've seen record defaults hit China's local debt markets. Um, here, record defaults hit $800 billion. So we have the huge stimulus measures that the Chinese central bank, the PBOC, has put in place. But it seems these support measures over the, the weeks are more designed to put a floor under the economy rather than actually trigger growth. And I think we're going to certainly see more uh, stimulus coming out after the election when they identify who the uh, US president is because of course there'll be a pretty extreme events if Trump becomes president and he does impose 60% uh, tariffs that's going to hit the Chinese economy hard. Yeah I mean one one sort of uh, bit of positive news for the Chinese economy is that it uh, sounds as though the real estate market has found a bit of a flaw here. So we've seen sales of existing homes have risen uh, in China's biggest cities. Um, so th those include Beijing, Shenzhen and Shanghai. Um, so this was, I think, a, a consequence of supportive policies from this uh, stimulus bazooka that we saw. So whilst it may not have, uh, you know, really bolstered every aspect of the Chinese economy, it sounds as though some sales are going through. Uh, perhaps it's worrying that as many houses are up for sale as possible, but, you know, for, for them to have the transactions, you have to have a willing buyer as well. So it's not all doom and gloom. Yeah, if there's buyers, that puts a bit of a floor under the, the property market. Absolutely. Which they've been searching for pretty aggressively. So the overnight index swap pricing for the next 12 months ahead, well, it's still pricing 118 basis points of cuts from the Fed. Again, we have GDP data and employment data this week, so that will probably have a big impact on that market. Um, New Zealand, 171 basis points of cuts, while Australia is now down at 54 basis points of cuts by the RBA. And on that, looking at Aussie dollar, what I find interesting there is that the Aussie dollar has been falling for the last three to four weeks. That just highlights just how strong the US dollar has been. Again, while Aussie rates have not been falling, while other countries have been cutting, again, it highlights just how aggressively US yields have been going higher. Um, with that, of course, we have the key Australian data coming out this week, their CPI. And what the RBA focus on there is typically the trim mean. So that'd be one to keep a watch an eye on this week. And we have payrolls on Friday. Again, last month's payrolls was surprisingly strong compared to the ISM data and continuing claims. What we can see is the labour market continuing to weaken from the last couple of weeks data. 
Job postings have declined 27.4% year over year to the lowest level since January 2021. And job postings have declined for two and a half straight years and now down 45% since February 2022 peak. Um, last week's jobless claims were slightly strongly expected, but continuing claims continue to be weaker than expected, rising to 1.897 million. An interesting chart I've pulled up here shows non-farm payrolls the black line, and it shows the Kansas City labor market conditions. Um, again, one small area of the economy, but you can see the correlation here. And it's not just uh, Kansas as well. I mentioned last week, Nevada unemployment has risen to a three-year high. So really, it looks, last month's payrolls number looks like an anomaly. Call me a cynic, but I don't think you're going to get particularly weak data four days before the election. No. But you can definitely see the trend coming out from regional data. Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. And uh, we will we'll, we'll obviously keep an eye out on uh, on Friday for that. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised, similar to you, if this, uh, wh whichever data came out, came out strong and then perhaps had to be revised down in a few months' time. Again, we're not going to throw a chart of the week up because there's going to be so much volatility this week. We're just going to highlight again a chart, a trend we like. Um, the twos, tens continues to steepen. Um, we see central banks cutting rates at the front of the curve, but it's the back of the curve where we're seeing more aggressive selling, particularly if you have concerns about the US budget deficit. So currently trading around 16 basis points. The first target would be 45 basis points. The stop loss at minus 20, but you can see the curve continuing to steepen. Interestingly as well, equity markets normally struggle when the curves steepen. But that actually is not so much about long-end tightness, all that does of course hurt equities, particularly uh, tech. That's more because at the front of the curve, central banks are cutting rates into recession. The US isn't there yet, but other countries clearly are. So onto this week's data. I've said it's the most concentrated week of data we've had all year. Of course, we have 20% of S&P companies reporting their earnings as well. It starts fairly light on Tuesday. We have U.S. consumer confidence and jolts data. But then on Wednesday, we have U.S. Q3 GDP. Pending home sales, Chinese PMI data out overnight as well. Australian CPI, big number out of Australia. Eurozone GDP and also the U.K. budget. So that's a pretty huge day. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, from uh, from a London perspective, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, the UK budget for sure. But yeah, you know, Q3 GDP in the US as well, just before the election, this is going to be very significant. Um, and uh, also, you know, the data doesn't stop there as we carry on through the week. Yep. He won there as well, I think, Chinese PMIs. Mm. So in London, that comes out at 1.30 in the morning. So you come in and... It's already active. Yep, and that's well, our focus here on commodities and oil. That's going to be important, how manufacturing, if that we start to see any recovery out of China. But Thursday, we have US PCE inflation data, the employment cost index. We have Bank of Japan rate day. We don't expect any change in the rate from the BOJ. Eurozone CPI in unemployment and Canadian GDP. So another big day of data there on Thursday, and that's before the big one on Friday, US October payrolls, and we also get ISM manufacturing later in the day. Pretty huge week, and of course, that's warming up into the election on the 5th. So that brings us to the end of this week's Macro Monday. I will actually be in Asia the next two weeks, but James, you'll be running the show. Absolutely. And we look forward to seeing you then. It's going to be a busy week. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you.